Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my peers and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Sam Fatuhi. Sam is a co-founder and the CEO of Bomello. Sam, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me. Really excited to be on. Really excited to have you, buddy. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I'm, I love listening to it. I'm, I'm excited to be a participant. Yeah, I, I'm excited. This was a last-minute get. Um, quick quick change of scheduling, but, you know, I, I think you're better than the other guy. Um, <laughs> don't tell them I said that. <laughs> but, uh him or her I, I don't know exactly who the other guy is so i'm not gonna be able oh, to I'm, tell i'll never person. say <laughs> <laughs> so i know that i'm at least better than one person so that makes me feel very good <laughs> yeah well yeah and i'm and again i'm just excited to have you on um i had a great time hanging out with you uh last week in boston we were at the robotics summit and expo together and um I just just all around good hang um your product seems interesting it's always good to see somebody sort of starting down the journey of a new business, um, founding a company and the optimism that that takes to do. And so, yeah, I don't know. Yep. I mean, you seem like a down to earth human being. I'm excited to learn more about you and hang out and have a few drinks together. What does Bamello do, I guess? And, and how'd you go down that road? Um, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So Bamello, we are a, a product lifecycle management software company. And so the reason we we're actually at this robotics conference was Robotics companies, a lot of them have hardware. Most of them do. And um, one of the things that we found is that there's a lot of the, the software that we're building isn't a completely new paradigm of software. There's been product life, so like PLM is the most common acronym. There's been PLM software in the market for you know decades now, but it's typically made by companies like the Oracles, like Siemens, like um, PTC. And it's very much geared towards large enterprise companies. And we felt that there was a really big gap of simple, easy to use PLM software that can be um, deployed by startups. And so this robotic summit was a really exciting opportunity to talk to companies like, let's say anywhere from 10 to 300 employees um, and really speak to the benefits of what we can do, which is really uh, managing your bomb. Really, we help uh, our customer manage their bill of materials. That means seeing your sort, being able to very easily and quickly access your source of truth um, being able to change those uh, that information and update it and trace and track all that information and uh, do it in such a way that you don't need to basically spend six to nine months to deploy it and spend hours trying to find your data. As startups and small businesses, you got to get your data in there quickly, in and out of there quickly. And so that's why um, that's why we've built it the way that we've built it in such a um, easy to use, easy to deploy fashion. And really the history is that I've worked in hardware companies before in the past. My last company, we built a kind of a smart sensor technology and we saw the complexity. I mean, we were a few dozen people when I left the company and we saw the complexity of managing our supply chain. Things have only gotten more and more complicated in the last couple of years. And so it just felt like it was a good time to build this software. It felt like there's really kind of a big gap in, I'd say, work workflow software for hardware companies and that's what made me excited to uh, bring Bomello to market. That's awesome. I wonder if there's a benefit to big companies too on that, right? Because I mean, if you have to hire several administrators that you wouldn't otherwise need to hire in order to wrangle a difficult piece of software, like, I mean, I, I see this with some of our larger clients too, and I won't name names, but there's a particular piece of software that we've been having to contend with a lot lately. And you know what I'm talking about from our conversation mm -hmm. that we had. But it's a huge pain in the rear, and I feel like, you know, I mean, that, that's that got to not just be that class of software that has to apply to PLMs as well. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, there was an article I read about, like, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal or something, um, about the hidden problem of legacy software and how it just plagues big companies, where there's a lot of enterprise companies that invested in software, but it's either... No, you know, it's not cloud-based or it's legacy cloud, like older systems that just don't don't solve problems for them effectively. 
And specific to PLM, um, I went on LinkedIn and looked for every single person with the name PLM in their title, like not just their responsibility, because there are people, there might be, so I'll, I'll split this up. If you're talking about PLM in your title, there was 20,000 people with PLM in their title. And I think I found over 100,000 people, probably 200,000, I believe. I don't remember the exact number that had PLM somewhere in their resume. And oh, that's inter- how many people on LinkedIn altogether, just for perspective? I mean, hun- probably millions. All right. Um, yeah, fair enough. It's a big group of, I mean, granted, like, yeah, there's, you know, you any job, a doctor's on LinkedIn, right? And of course, they're not yeah. going to be touching PLM software. But the thing that made it very interesting to me was these are all people, the people who are PLM in their title are all typically very, it's a mechanical engineer, it's an electrical engineer, it's a um, software developer, it's a robotics engineer, it's an aeronaut engineer that could be building something, but they're kind of now stuck just managing a system like you pointed out. And so absolutely, I think there's a big opportunity to simplify those workflows in big companies. We just know that as a startup, those buying cycles take typically years. And so I want to get feedback. I want to get the product in people's hands. I want to give people the benefit as quickly as possible. And then, you know, um, we can start attacking the enterprise in the future. But I think for us, uh, working with small to medium sized businesses, it's very great to be able to sit down, talk with the um, executive team, understand exactly their problems and then solve their problems for them. Yeah, that's well put. Um, when I started my um, contract engineering company, SKA Robotics, I mean, we did a lot of startup work. And I mean, I, I really cut my teeth on startups, just, you know, dozens of them, like, you know, solving similar engineering problems, different engineering problems, working on drones, working on crawlers, working on, you know, products that work yeah. on robots at the start and um, just trying lots and lots of different things. I mean, it's a great way to, I mean, you know, cut your teeth and learn. And so it sounds like you're just trying to kind of develop the product as quickly as possible. Part of that's user yeah. feedback. You can get that faster from startups. So why wouldn't you do that? Exactly. I mean, we feel really confident with our product that's in market now. Um, but the great thing about software is that's going to keep getting better. I, I kind of always joke with people and say, whatever you buy from me today is going to be the worst software you ever buy from me because every week we're going to keep improving, keep iterating, keep making it better. And we really are excited about getting people using it, getting their feedback. And so our early stage customers, I, I tell them that you're not really getting a custom engineering team, but you're going to get pretty damn close to one because like basically we're we're going to take your feedback and implement it as quickly as possible. That's awesome. And they'll obviously have an outsized influence on our roadmap because it's been my history of success of really developing the product based on your active customers. Obviously, you're always chasing new business. But really, the people that are using your cus- your product, your your active customers, are the ones that are going to be able to really give you the best feedback um, on what's going to make it a better solution. And then naturally, by salt serving your customers, um, I'll, you you you'll get new customers because your product's just naturally going to get better. Yeah, and I guess to your point, I mean, sometimes I feel like when you are working with larger enterprise, um, I mean, this isn't universally true, but in my experience, it can be harder to get a straight answer. You know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's also you have many answers. You have a lot of different stakeholders with different yeah. um, inputs and feedback. And so different perspectives uh, and, and, you know, backgrounds and, you know, yeah, they might not even touch the software, but still have an opinion on it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. But Sam, why can't I just put my BOM in a spreadsheet? (laughs) Well, I think um, really a lot of people do. So that's how people mostly start. And actually, there's an interesting article I read that the Williams F1 team was using spreadsheets um, up until recently to manage their entire bill of materials. So people do that because existing PLM software, as we've talked about, is very much geared towards enterprises, very much difficult to use. And so obviously people start by managing their data in a spreadsheet. What often becomes very difficult is uh, the spreadsheet isn't d- doesn't have any guardrails. So people can just update what they want willy nilly. Um, there's often many different spreadsheets to manage different bombs and different types of data. So if you're just saying, what is the full source of truth for 
you know, obviously this is an, this is an Apple product, but like what is the full source of truth for everything sitting in here and every single component, including documentation, all the pieces, you have to go to like five, 10 different spreadsheets to find that information. And so where we are is one consolidated source of truth for all that information. And then we um, uh, also help you update that information without basically making one of your senior, senior engineers being a throat to choke to, to be like, or maybe a bottleneck is a better term to manage that particular component there. So yeah. one of the big things is like, it's a lot more efficient to manage it with a, with a purpose built tool. Well, and I mean, to be honest, like we procedurally generate BOMs from SolidWorks and other softwares sort of in a less sophisticated way on a lot of projects. And I mean, even that, you know, is a big step up from using a spreadsheet because, you know, it's so easy to omit a detail or forget about something or just not update it when a design change is made or somebody changes something over here and it just doesn't make it to the person that's maintaining this. You have no tr you have very poor traceability. You have very poor ability to know, like actually know exactly what that source of truth is across multiple different components. And so that's, that's ultimately what, you know, it's, it's, we know that spreadsheets just aren't scalable and what we're trying to convey to people, even at, you know, smaller points where they might have just stuck with spreadsheet for a bit while, a bit longer is that there's a much better and easier way. And it's, you know, we built a solution that's very easy to onboard and start with. So when did you decide this needed to exist? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And so it was really kind of this last, I always knew this was a problem, but really I started doing a lot more research into it like this last summer with my co-founder and where we, we needed to figure out that is this a real problem? Or is this um, that people are willing to pay for, frankly? And fortunately, I have a background in engineering. I've worked with a lot of software engineers, hardware engineers. So I was able to connect and people work in operations. Um, so I, all those different functions are folks who touch PLM software. And so I, I talked to folks who have small startups, to folks who are working at the Googles and Apples and the large enterprises of the world. And all of them came to the same conclusion that this software is mandatory, is highly valuable, and it's not solved very well today. And so that's that's where I really realized, okay, there there's a problem, it's worth solving, and there's a lot of value in the solution. And so then really, that's when I came to market, Rob, my co-founder and I uh, decided to start our business. And then, then what we spent our first few months doing was really, we made a concerted effort not to write any code uh, for the first couple of months to just talk to people and understand their feedback, their concerns, their complaints. And then spent basically this year was when we spent really, really focused building the product. That's an awesome way to do it. I, I hope it's the right way. It feels like the right way because right now when we start getting in people's hands, we, we know not like typically they're, they're impressed with a product and we have a pretty good perspective on what else they might want too. So right now we already have a pretty good idea of what the roadmap will look even beyond what we built to, you know, for the first release. That's awesome. So what, I guess, can I ask, like, what features did you decide to start with? Like, what would, what were you like, you know, this doesn't exist, but it should? Yeah, we, well, and I would say in the general market, if you look at like a checklist, like almost everyone will have a similar concept of the features. So we had to pare down exactly what we wanted to do, frankly, because we have definitely a big, our eyes are very big on what we want to do, but we have to be able to, we also want to get the product in people's hands and not just build for nobody, right? Yeah, you don't want to build a bridge to nowhere, right? Yeah. So um, we really wanted to focus. I think the 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 way I'll kind of tailor that question is we wanted to focus on what we wanted to make it very special and easy. And we thought getting data in and out of the system is very critical. Um, being able to find your parts very quickly because our parts is, our system is essentially a database of all parts and software and documentation that people will use. So it's, you know, your electronic CAD, your mechanical parts, your electronic parts, your, your software, your documentation, your labels, like everything that consists of what a hardware product is. Um, we wanted to make sure it's very easy to find that information from, you know, whether you filter to find things, whether you have part numbering, whether you search, like we want to ba basically make it really easy to get data in and out of the system, find the data and make changes to the data. Our, we took a lot of corollaries from the software world. Uh, so the software world, and this was something funny, we felt like software engineers um, love to solve their own problems. So software tools are really pretty good. I mean, obviously they're, they all, every tool can always get better, uh, but the software tools for, 
product development for for all those pieces there are pretty good uh we felt hardware tools weren't as good so can we build something maybe taking some examples from the software world of how people use certain tools we took a lot of examples from kind of the software world of how people manage diffs how people manage their inventory uh, or their parts catalog probably is a better term than inventory and and use that in our system so i think we we focused on a few areas to make really special i think import export search um, change orders and diffs were i think some of the capabilities that we thought we want to add a special twist to this to make this product a lot easier to use than what's out there today nice so what is a diff in this context a diff that's a good point it's a difference of everything in your bomb so like it could be that you updated a document. It could be that your CAD revision has updated. So someone moved the location of a screw or changed um, uh, you know, something on their layout. It could be one of the subparts changed. Let's say somebody has chosen to use a, um, you know, a brass fitting versus a stainless steel fitting or something like that for a variety of different reasons. It could be um, you, cho you chose to change a housing or you chose a different resistor. You need a 10 ohm resistor rather than a five ohm resistor, right? So all those things are the difference in your um, your bill of materials. And so we'll give people kind of a, a very simple and easy to understand. Here's everything that's actually changed and what your, your current source of truth is. Here's what you're proposing a change of. And then when people are reviewing that, they can very quickly understand, okay, this new thing has changed. You know, this is, uh, this is, is this okay? Is it okay that we're using brass now versus stainless steel or a different um, quality of stainless steel or whatever reason or a different material for our housing or a different role? Like then the, you know, your electrical engineers or your operations professionals can say, oh, this is gonna increase our cost, bomb cost by this much, or we're gonna have to source it from these guys and this takes two weeks versus one week. So being able to really see everything that's changed in a particular bill of materials is critical across engineering and manufacturing, purchasing, um, different departments, documentation, control, and all those those that's, teams. So, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say that's really cool. So it almost sounds like you're back generating a change log. Um, yeah, is your diff functionality exactly, exactly. Yeah, and so the diff, and then your change log represents what's in the actual the diff itself. That's awesome. So tell me a little bit about the work you've done in like consulting. Like you were with Deloitte, you were with Boston Consulting Group. Like I don't know that many people with that kind of pedigree. Like, what was that actually like to get in, and then what was it like to do, and then you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, those kind of firms, they do like they've got specific folks that like with parameter, like with and consulting can mean a lot of things. There's a lot of people who do consulting. There's a lot of like implementation consultings. There's there's probably million plus people with a title consultant or consult something associated with it. Sure. Um, what I was doing when I was at um, Boston Consulting Group and Deloitte was what the category of consulting called management consulting, where typically um, our customers were often like large enterprise companies and they needed something, you know, strategic operational help with. It could be an M&A. It could be they want to uh, release a new product. They need help with it. It could be um, they need to uh, change the way that they do sales, like they need to do sales operations. A lot there, there's a lot of different kinds of work that you do. Um, they're they're looking for different people with different resumes. It used to be like, okay, go go get your MBA and then you'll get a, a you know job at a consultancy. Um, they're doing a lot different recruiting. They're recruiting a lot of people with various different types of degrees. Um, pretty much every undergraduate degree. You know, they're not looking for anybody. There's like they're not looking for anybody exactly. They're just looking for somebody with a willingness to learn and work. Basically, um, I I got in through I, when I went to business school. I they recruited me, um, or I recruited with um, uh, with Deloitte first to join them. And really, the type of work that you do there is you you work with a particular company, and they might have a particular challenge. And I can give kind of a couple examples of some of the more interesting projects I did. Um, one is that I was working with a major automotive company and we were helping them literally sell cars online. And it sounds kind of silly because you're like, oh, you could buy like a like anything online today. But for them, because they have these dealer networks, it's very complicated. Oh, and that's interesting. And you still have to have a dealer in the loop somehow or it, you have to have the dealer in the loop. And you also have these financing complications, too, because let's say you are a, you know, Hyundai, Honda, Toyota, Ford whatever right dodge and you have um you're like i want somebody to be able to go to a website and buy my car 
Well, they can't like dictate to their dealers. Their dealers are independent companies. And if, you know, let's say Ford is barking down somebody's throat and saying, you need to sell, you need to do this. They might say, well, I'm not going to be sell Fords anymore. I'm going to sell, you know, Toyotas now, right? Like they can switch what they want to sell. It's, I mean, obviously there's contracts, but contracts go both ways. So they need to work with their dealership network who might not always want to be, they might want people to come to the dealership to negotiate price of cars. They also are involved with the leasing terms and the, the a lot of the financial services. So when it comes to like selling cars online, you could just be like, oh, this is very easy, but you have to get a whole large ecosystem from the dealers to the financers to the actual corporate entity to be able to do that. And so that we were working uh, with one of the major automotive companies to build develop a strategy. And as you can tell, like, I don't think most of the major automotive companies uh, allow you to do that yet. So it's a multi, many, many year type effort that's going well, which out Which means there. if you get in there first, though, then you're, you're it's, kicking it's, everyone else's ass. Cause, like, it's a very, and obviously I know people who buy Teslas and electric certain cars just because they don't like to haggle and they don't want to do that. I, I'd say exactly like my, my mom bought a Tesla. Oh, I'm sorry. One of the big reasons. Yeah. Yeah, so that's I was right. gonna say I'm thinking of switching from SolidWorks to Onshape for that reason. Like, I'm yeah, you just want you don't want to negotiate; you just want to buy direct, right? Like, yeah, just, I mean, I love negotiating, but not like meaninglessly, like the you know this dumb Sisyphusian bullshit. You yeah, know? <laughs> like, yeah. It's like, what's the price? Just tell me what the price is, and I'll pay it. Just yeah. stop making me negotiate all over the place. Yeah. Um, so that was an interesting one. Another interesting one was a large software company. Uh, I was they basically had a group that had, you know, a couple hundred million dollar budget. They had thousand they had a lot of employees and they were trying to adjust how they spent their money from they wanted to start doing a lot more corporate good and like incentivize like certain like um public services that they thought were you know in the end result good for them and good for the company and good for them as like a you know corporate stakeholder and so we were working with them to basically help them you know adjust what they spent their money on in a particular group and prioritize their, their efforts and all, you know, all the work that they were doing, helping them do some research in the areas that they wanted to get involved with. Cause there were certain things that they wanted to do, but they didn't know all the ins and outs of it. They just said, we're interested in this, um, this general space. How do we solve this problem? So we work with them on like a pretty massive project to help them kind of reorganize uh, how their business was structured and run. And so it's, and the day-to-day -day is often you're talking to people, you're interviewing them, you're understanding what they're doing, and you're coming at them with a um, recommendation of how to do what they ultimately, like their team wanted to do, because you, you're brought in with a project to solve a certain problem, and you, everyone loses if you come up with a solution that they're not going to actually do. Yeah. So you need to work with them to understand how they're going to do what you're recommending them to do, and then... Um, and then come up with a plan to execute on it. And I think a lot of times people make the comment of consultants that like, oh, but you're in and out. So like, you know, you don't own the result. And that's that's true to some extent. But there's also the extent that w the number one source of consulting revenue is follow on business, right? So not, not mean that, you know, you, you want to support them on future projects and other engagements. So you want to make sure that you've given them a recommendation that they'll actually be able to do in the future. I'm always trying to figure out what future shows to go to. Cause right now we've just released our software and the robotics conference. I went to the first one uh, in, or the last one, whatever, the one in Santa Clara. And that seemed like a good show. So we had a booth. Um, oh, we, I, I was there. I'm, I'm disappointed we didn't no, run no, into I, each other. When I brought up this, I'm pretty sure you and I had lunch actually one of the days at that event, but we just, you know, we didn't keep in touch then. So uh, I, we obviously didn't. We didn't have a drink or anything. We didn't hang out that night. Um, we went to that show, and that was really kind of a learning experience to meet people, to um, understand, to get a few people that wanted to talk about the problem a little bit more. And so we met a few uh, great people at that show. And then um, this last show, I said, "Well, this is a robotics show. There's going to be a lot of great people there, so let's go there." And then we're trying to. I'm trying to figure out: Is CES a worthwhile show? What What are the great? Like you mentioned, automation um, show that's coming up this week. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to go to that, but figuring out like a good, good places that people are interested in the problem that we're solving, basically. That was my booth number, and 
people were just like, oh, how do you not remember it? Four is a number. Three is one less. <laughs> you have it, two. It's seven. That's an easy number to remember. I just love – that was a great mnemonic, but I just love the four is a number like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> four, you start with four, which is a number, yeah. and then one less, and then seven. Add them together. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Done. That's the booth. That was fun. I wish it was my booth forever because then I could just use that all the time. Maybe I'll always look for the four, three, seven. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you could find another, like, you know, just – contrived math problem that makes it make sense. I'll ask ChatGPT to tell me something something goofy about every boot number I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it. I mean, like, yeah. No, you can always figure something out, right? Like, yeah, 639. 6, which is a number. 3, which is a number that's half that. And 9, which is them added together. Like, Boom. Boom. Yeah. Or 369, like that little John yeah, song. fine. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, that song was always hilarious. Like a lot of the the stuff that came out of that that genre and that era was just so funny. Like, like the Yin Yang Twins song uh, was pretty hilarious. Um, Any Master P song was Master hilarious. Master P was hilarious. Yeah, Ice Cream Man. Uh, <laughs> Any 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 of those ice like, cream man is like is amazing. Like I, I still early two thousands, late nineties, like all those like pop they're just yeah. they're they're just goofing off and having fun. What yeah. the what's the guy's juvenile? juvenile <laughs> yeah. No, what was that exhibit show? The um no no the exhibit was Pimp Your Ride, Pimp but there was Ride, the other one yeah. the what was the one the house where they would go the the cribs, M T V cribs. Oh that's funny. Who was that? Was that that wasn't like a Wu Tang yeah. clan member, was it, that did that? I don't remember who it might have been one of their personalities, but I remember when they went to Redman's house. And it was just a regular house. <laughs> there, was, there was a bit of like laundry on the floor. You had like some guys sitting at his house playing video games. There was no furniture. And he's like, yeah, this. And then, you know, they tried to jazz it. They'd be like, they'd zoom in on something, and it'd be just like a shower with like soap. <laughs> ironing board right here. You know, we iron on the floor in here. You know, it's easy to iron and watch TV at the same time. This is the bedroom, so you know, a lot of entertainment. I like to get right in in here watching a lot of DVD movies and stuff. The nasty movies, the freaks, you know. This is for the freaks right here. I mean, good, good for him, though. I mean, that's like Warren Buffett still living in like a duplex, right? Like, it's like. Exactly. You know, exactly. Like, so it's yeah, yeah I made of money, but I'm not a sucker. You know? Yeah, <laughs> he just had some deep playing video games on like he was like sitting on dirty laundry playing video games. Like. <laughs> oh yeah, that's my cousin right there. He, you know, he he be knocked out over here. You know, chilling in the cut. That sugar bear right there. Don't worry about him. He don't even hear y'all. Y'all not like he even here. But like, I think it's the best one because all the other ones are like really exaggerated, you know, elaborate houses. Uh, and it's all fake. Like half the time, it's like they don't even live there. They just rented the house for the episode. Oh, that's interesting. Man, you got Redman goofing off with like <laughs> his buddy crashing his place playing PlayStation on dirty laundry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're like out of substantial stuff to talk about. Um, Carl can hopefully cut, cut this down to a nice half hour. Um, is there anything you want to plug as we're uh, as we're getting out of here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we. I would say that uh, we've got a great product in the market. We're looking to get folks. I know a lot of your uh, listeners are plugged into the robotics world and so forth. And um, I think it's a great value prop for people to, to come on board because I think, as I mentioned earlier, we're not really building, I wouldn't say we're building custom software, but we're building a solution that is going to be pretty tailor-made to people coming on board at this stage. So they're going to be able to you know, uh, adopt a solution that's, um, only going to grow and get better in time. And we believe it solves a lot of problems. And really our goal is to help people get to revenue faster. And I think when you think about uh, any type of growing business, that's especially in the hardware the world, you don't want to be holding too much inventory. You don't want to be making mistakes and scrapping a bunch of stuff. Uh, you don't want to be wasting your engineer's time going back and back with chain, back and forth with like various change orders or updating data that they don't need to update. So um, we've got a solution and market for them and, you know, excited to work with, uh, excited to bring it to market and work with a lot of your listeners. That's awesome. Well, check out Bamello if you're listening. Um, Sam, thanks for coming on. I had a blast and uh, let's do this again sometime. Absolutely, Spencer. Thanks so much for the time, man. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for joining us today. If you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, 
Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Thanks again and see you on the next one.